Thanks for being here. And we are beginning this brand new series called Passages That Pump Me Up. In fact, in this series that we're doing for three weeks, next week, next week is going to be a very unique week, something at Reality Church that we have never done before. You're going to get a glimpse of all of our pastors speaking on key passages that pump them up. Each pastor here is going to take our children's pastor, youth pastor, Daniel. Uh, we're going to take different passages, and we're going to kind of tag team up here and communicate to you why certain passages in the Bible pump me up or pump them up. So uh, that's next week, and if you're in town and not going away, I know if you're in town, you don't want to miss this opportunity to hear the other pastors of the church as well and uh, passages that just, you know, just toss their salad. I'm just saying, all right? It's going to be a good thing. So now, uh, as we jump in today, I just, I think we should set the scene like this. As I was growing up uh, young, um, I was part, grew up part of um, a religion many of you are familiar with or have heard about, Catholicism. Uh, we were an Italian family, came from New York uh, originally, my parents, and six kids, and we were all brought up pretty staunch Catholic. But my relationship with God, or what I knew to be, what I thought to be of God, the understanding of God, um, was, was not a personal one. It was a distant one. Actually, as I was growing up and young, I thought of God as, as big. I thought of God as, as distant. And, and I, and I kind of thought of God as, as someone to be feared, um, that if I kind of got off track too much, there's judgment coming and I would be popped. And, and that was basically, as a young person, my, my view of God. Now, what happens is we get older, and, and you start in your, um, probably in your teens, you start and I start formulating different opinions about whether we even believe in God or not. But if we do, it's more like, um, what do I think about him based upon information I'm getting, empirical evidence I receive, and experiences that take place in my life. And I start to kind of put God together like this or like that, and I, and I begin to determine that this is what God is like. And then I get a little bit older, maybe 18, maybe 20, maybe 25, and I determine somewhere in those years, maybe, probably, do I even believe in God at all? Does he even exist? And if he does, this is probably what he's like because now I've pretty solidly formed my opinion. This is obviously what God is like. Um, he's a God who doesn't answer prayer because one time I prayed or this prayer I prayed for this person and it didn't happen, this bad thing took place so God can't be real or he doesn't answer prayer or he's distant. And so we, we come to places in all our lives, every one of us in here, it's, it's not possible to be unbiased entirely. We're all biased somehow, some way. And based upon your experiences and the empirical evidence that you see, you come to determine uh, what God is like if he even exists in your mind at all. Maybe you're here today and think, I I'm not even sure if he exists. Uh, uh, I'm, not, I I'm certainly not sure if Jesus is who he said he was, but God, I I'm just not sure he's the God of the Bible or the God of the Bible that's, you know, what it, the Bible says about him is even true. In fact, you may not even know what the Bible says about him. So what are we going to do today? What we're going to look at is what Americans think of God. Now, there was a book that was published not too long ago called The Four Gods of America. And uh, in 2008, Gallup poll did a study, the biggest study on religion ever in the United States. And they gathered thousands of people and asked them certain questions about their view of God. And um, so nine out of ten people believed in God in the United States. And then two years later, in 2010, they did the same thing and came to reveal, again, again the biggest that's ever been, the biggest um, poll that's ever been taken, religiously speaking, and came to find out that most Americans do believe in God, but the question is, what kind of God? What kind of God do Americans, you and I, what kind of God do we actually believe in? Well, they came to see that the report uh, looked like this. And if you bring this up on the screen, we're going to look at the view of God in America, you know, pretty much right now. 21% of the population basically says that God is a critical God. He's a critical God. 
24% of us, almost one-fourth of the United States of America, believes that God is distant. Now, that was part of my view, and I also kind of believed he was critical, so I kind of had a mix of these. And then 28%, large number, believe that God is authoritarian. You know, do it this way, or else. You know, it's just like, it's, it, he's, he runs the show, this is how it is, boom. And then only 22% believed that God was a benevolent God. And in that uh, idea of the benevolent aspect of God, sometimes people believe that not only is God benevolent and loving, but he's so loving that there's no judgment at all. That is, you die and everybody goes to heaven because you know, God took care of sin and actually swept it under the rug or whatever wrongdoing. And since he's the God of love, there's no judgment whatsoever. The, the point that I'm trying to make in this study is simply this. There is sort of truth to all of these, but probably not like you think, and probably not like I would think, just by observing the evidences that we see with our eyes or what we've heard from our professors or our parents or uh, friends or whatnot. So what I thought we would do today is share a passage of Scripture that is most unusual. It actually is a passage of Scripture that pumps me up so much because it reveals who God is. In other words, it's a passage of scripture where God actually says, hey guys, you know what? Here's what I'm like. You don't have to guess anymore. You don't have to play conjecture games any longer. Um, In fact, we've never had to play those games. Uh, Americans do because they don't read the Bible or they don't know what God is like, but um, God reveals what he is like. He tells us self-discloses what he's like. And that's what I want to talk with you about today. And it so jazzes me up when I read this. I'm like, finally, I don't have to guess anymore what the God of the Bible, the God of the universe, the creator is all about. So let me set the scene for you before we get into scriptures. You can take that graph back down. And uh, Israel, the, the nation of Israel is, is, um, is in its infancy stage and it is in, they are in captivity. And they have been in captivity for over four centuries at this point where they are under Egyptian bondage. Actually, the number of years that they have been slaves in Egypt, cutting their stone and their images for the pharaohs, being subjugated in every way with the lash of the whip, slaves to every whim and law that the Egyptians had, 430 years they have been in this condition. In, as a slave, generation after generation after generation. Now, just think about how old the United States of America is. You know, we're more than 200, but not 300 years of age yet. And these people have been in slavery for over four centuries, a very long time. They don't even know their identity anymore. They don't know who they are. And they have all but forgotten the God of Israel. They don't know his ways. They don't know much about him at all. Why? Because over 430 years, it's been lost, whatever was known of God before, much of it. And so what took place was God's timing is now at hand where he wants to deliver Israel from Egyptian slavery and Egyptian bondage. And so Moses, he he meets with Moses. God, uh, the story is Moses is out tending sheep, Moses used to be uh, one of the leaders of, of Egypt, and he killed an Egyptian, and he fled for his life, and so he's been gone for 40 years. So Moses is 80 years of age at this point. He's tending his, his flock of sheep around Mount Horeb, and he is, um, uh, he's looking for one that's gotten away, and then God catches his attention with that, what you know is called the burning bush. And so God starts to, I'm giving you a long story short, Moses Uh, is summoned by God to go back to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, I want you to let my people, the Israelites, go. God's saying, I want you to say to Pharaoh, let God's people, my people, go. Now Moses is 80 years of age. He probably doesn't want to do this, right? He's kind of got a, a chilled out life, but God's been preparing him all along. And so he finally relents, and he goes back reluctantly to Pharaoh, and um, Pharaoh says no, and God brings the ten plagues upon Egypt, and the last plague causes Pharaoh to go, okay, I'm going to relent, you can go, because I can't take any more of these plagues, they're devastating our land, our people, our cattle, everything we've got, and now my firstborn dies. Just go, get out of here, and take all the gold and all the stuff that you want with you, just go, go, bye, out of here, done. And so the big movement takes place, about three to four million people take off, And they're going to this place 
where God wants to give them laws that, listen, they never had before. They haven't had for 430 years. They don't know how to live life apart from Egyptian law. Do you get it? They need law. They need to know how to act. And so they're being brought to Mount Sinai and going to receive God's laws. So they get there, and what, and, but before they get there, Pharaoh comes back when they're about at, caught at the Red Sea, and they're like, how do we cross? There's no bridge here. They didn't make bridges back then, you know, kind of thing. And so uh, uh, Pharaoh comes and, and uh, says, oh, what have we done? We've let them go. And uh, at that time, God parts the Red Sea. They cross. God keeps Pharaoh's army from crossing because he blocks them with fire and whatnot. And so just as they get to the other side of the Red Sea, the Israelites, God allows uh, the, the army of Egypt to start crossing the Red Sea on dry ground like they were, and, uh, and then collapses the Red Sea on them. They all drown. There's a few left over, meaning basically one or two, like Pharaoh. And, uh, and, and that's how that's all recorded as with Moses. Anyway, nonetheless, uh, the miracle takes place. And so the Israelites see all these miracles, the 10 plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, and then God provides for them in the wilderness food and water. But the Israelites murmur. They complain. They grumble. And they're at the mountain where God is summoning Moses to give him the commandments. And Moses, in their eyes, has gone too long. And so what happens? They, make, um, they start having wild parties, the worst kind that you could ever imagine in your mind's eye. And so for 40 days, Moses is up meeting with God, and he gets the Ten Commandments. God writes and, and carves out the, the stone by himself, gives it to Moses tells Moses, the people down in the camp, the millions of people, we didn't know the word millions until the late 13th century, by the way, so tens of thousands of people, in other words, multitudes of thousands of people down there, they are um, committing sin and wrongdoing against God, and one of the things that they did was they began to create and make a golden calf, which you've probably heard of before, and said that this is the God that got us and delivered us from Egypt, and they just made it. You know, they made it and said, this is the one who delivered us from Egypt. The God that Moses went to is obviously dead. He's not coming down from the mountain. And so they were sinning a great sin against this God who just delivered them and creating a golden calf. So they're, they're sinning against God. Moses comes down. He gets down and he, he comes to, you know, higher than the base of the mountain. They're all down in the valley. And he calls out to them, what are, you know, basically, what are you doing? And he's so ticked off. The Bible said he burned with anger. He takes the Ten Commandments and he throws them at the base of the mountain and they, they're smashed. And what takes place, basically, those who are on God's side come to Moses, those who don't, and there's thousands of people who die that day because they're rejecting uh, God. God is burning in anger in one sense because he just showed all his power and his goodness and delivering Israel from a great slavery. And what do they do? They turn around and they smack God in the face. They poke him in the eye and say, take that, God. So um, Moses is like, you know, God, I, I don't know who you are. I'm trying to figure out, you know, are you a God who's just like all these other gods? You get them mad and, and you're done? Life's gone? Are you impersonal? What kind of a God are you? And so we come down to what God begins to say, and it says this. Um, this is not on the screen, so just listen to what it says uh, here in Exodus chapter 31. And I'm going to back up just a bit. Here's what it says. When the Lord finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God. And the Lord said to Moses, quick, go down the mountain, give the people whom you brought from the land of Egypt, uh, your people, they have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the commands, commandment um, that I gave them to live. They have melted down gold and made a calf, and they have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it. They are saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. See? And then the Lord said, see, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. So one chapter later, then, that's in Exodus 32. Then Exodus 33, and I'm just setting this up, and we're going to move right to the screen here in just a second. It says in Exodus 33, the next chapter, one day after all this took place, God um, basically is moving on now with the people, and he wants them to go to um, the, the promised land. And it says, One day Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, so Moses is speaking to God, You have been telling me, Take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. 
You have told me, I know you, Moses, by name, and I look favorably on you. If it's true, God, that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways. Listen to this. Let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. So Moses wants to know about this God. Now listen, and remember that this nation is your very own people. So at that point, we're at now what we want to see, what is God really like? So Moses asked God, God, I've seen some things, but I, I don't understand what you're really like. Would you show me? So God begins and tells him in two verses a lot about what he's like, and here's what it says. Look at the screens. Here's what it says. Exodus chapter 34. We're going to see the five attributes, five of God's attributes, his nature, right here. It says, Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and called out his own name, the Lord, as Moses stood there in his presence. The first thing I want you to see is that God is personal. He's not like the impersonal deities of the uh, gods of Egypt. He's personal, he's near, he's involved, and he's relational. He came down and he stood there. Moses stood there in God's presence. So he's personal. And then he says in verse 6, look now. He passed in front of Moses and said, I am the Lord. I am the Lord, the merciful and gracious God. I am slow to anger and rich in unfailing love and faithfulness. Now, as only God can do, he reveals to mankind a self-portrait of his own nature and his own character in a dozen Hebrew words. In just a dozen Hebrew words, God reveals himself. In English, 25 words. In Hebrew, 12. And he reveals what he is like. In this verse, you can look and see God characterizes himself and begins to show Moses what he is like toward Moses, to all of Israel, and to all of those who are looking to him to find out what he's like. And so he says, after, he, uh, after all of what Israel has done and has slapped God in the face basically with their life and the way that they're walking their life after God has done all he's done for them, God passes in front of Moses and says this. Watch, he says, I am the Lord. And he says it twice, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. And what does that mean? It simply means... I am the Lord, and I am the self-existent one. I am the Lord means I am the self-existent one. That means God had no beginning and no end. And why God said this was because when he first appeared to Moses at the burning bush, this is what he said. So he wants Moses to know, I'm that same God that met you back at the burning bush. I am the self-existent one. But then God says it again. I am the Lord equals the self-existent one. But then in the next verse, he goes on to explain more of what this means. So at first, the self-existent one is God is powerful. He's self-existent. He's always been. He's eternal. And it just demonstrates God's power, his might, his strength, his sufficiency. He is satisfied and perfect within himself. But then he says, I am the Lord again. And now let me tell you my moral character. And this is where it really applies to you and to me. That God is not only mighty and big, which I knew that. He, he was strong. I, I got that back when I was a kid. Kind of grew up understanding that. Maybe your understanding of God is he's big and mighty and strong and powerful. But what is he really like, his character? What's his moral qualities like? And so Moses wanted to know that. And so he reveals it to Moses and for us all time. And here's what he says. He begins to reveal to Moses... And discloses himself as that self-existent one. And then he begins to share and he spells out the meaning of that name in words so beautiful that Moses is probably stunned, shocked, and in awe. Because the Bible says God is, and God says, I'm rich in all of what I'm about to tell you. And that is, I'm, a, I'm abounding in this. And so here's the first one. The very first one that you need to understand what God is like. And if you have had any question, any doubts in your mind, what God is like to you personally, don't have to doubt. You don't have to doubt anymore. It's going to be as clear as day. And here's what he says. I am merciful. That's the first thing. God says, I am merciful. And he says he abounds, he's rich in all of this, okay? So he's merciful. And what is the understanding of what merciful means? Merciful means that God is granting forgiveness to the guilty person. Now, the Israelites had been unbelieving at the Red Sea. They had constantly grumbled against God in the wilderness. They rebelled against God with the idol of the golden calf. 
This should have ended their existence, but what God did was he showed and demonstrated patience toward people. He could have said, enough with the stiff-necked people, enough with the rebellion. I'm done with these people already, but he didn't. Now, he's a merciful God. That means God grants forgiveness to those who are guilty, and that's all of us. Let me give you sort of an illustration. I was rushing to a meeting uh, about 10 days ago to a meeting with the staff, one of the staff, actually, I was meeting Jory, our children's pastor, uh, at the offices, and um, I was rushing to get there. And, uh, well, the scene was like this. I was going down Nimmo Parkway, and all of a sudden, I see in my rearview mirror red, white, and blue lights. And um, the officer stopped me, and uh, he said to me, "Um, Sir, do you know how fast you were going? And I said, "Um, about... 50? And he said, 58 in a 35. That's what he said. Ooh, no. Um, He said to me, why are you uh, going so fast? Where are you headed? And I said, I'm headed to a meeting that I'm going to be late for. (laughs) And so I asked him, "Um, can I have mercy? And the officer said, no mercy today. (laughs) So I'm sitting in my car, and I call up Jory. Jory, I'm sitting here, and I'm getting a ticket right now, and I'm going to be really late for our meeting. And um, so then when I got to the office, uh, her and Daniel were there talking and whatnot, and I walked in and said, that's what happens when you get a speeding. That's what happens when you you speed and you get caught. You get a thing called a ticket, you know. And, uh, and then I get to staff that night, so it was a Thursday. So I get to staff that night, and I tell the rest of the staff, this is what happened to me today. And uh, you know what they told me? They said, Steve, that's good for your image. <laughs> that's what my staff told me. Steve, that's good for your image. In other words, they think I'm a goody two-shoes or something. You know, you're, just like, uh, you're such a sissy, Steve. You don't do anything wrong. That's good for your image. And then they said I should post it on Facebook. <laughs> like a ticket, picture of it. You know, put it on Facebook. Mercy, you know right? Listen, I don't know about you, but for, for me, God's mercy is so amazing. Um, I didn't get mercy from, from that guy, but when I read the scripture about God being rich in mercy, that he forgives the guilty, meaning me, uh, I don't know if God's mercy ketchups your hot dog, but let me tell you, it ketchups my hot dog, okay? And uh, why this passage pumps me up so very much is this, and let me tell you why here, and it's not put on the screen, why this passage, why this idea of God's mercy pumps me up so much is, watch, look, because even though, here's what it is, even though you and I are guilty of crimes against a perfect righteous God. We're persistently doing wrong things against this perfect, righteous God. He pardons our sins without cost to us. This is why his mercy pumps me up so much. This is why I want to know about God. Because if he is merciful and he says he is, this is Steve, you know, and so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, God, you know, this is so, why do I love the scripture so much? And so I start to write down some things like, why? And so how can you experience God's mercy? And how can I? And when I'm writing this down, I'm thinking, you know, why do I love this so much? I'm trying to put it into words, and I wrote down things like this. This is kind of funny. You know, um, why I, I, just, I just love his mercy is because without it, the truth is, you and I are dead. We're dead dead. We have no life anymore. And how you can experience God's mercy and me is simply by asking for it because it's already his nature, you see. You don't have to doubt anymore what God is like. His nature is merciful and all he wants you to do, just you, just you, all he wants you to do is ask him for it. The proud person will never ask God for it. I'll take care of myself. I'm my own God. You know, I'm my own boss. I'm the captain of my own soul. I got this. But at the end of time, you won't have this anymore, you see. And God says, let me be the one who forgives you. I will atone for your sins, your wrongdoing. And if you, you say you never did wrong, uh, I don't think anybody really says that. We all want to, we've done things that are 
we've even been wrong to us. You know, it's not just others say we're wrong. We know we've done wrong. So how do you get forgiveness for that? It's a spiritual thing. It's got to be paid spiritually, and God has paid for it through the cross, the cross of Christ. And, and you and I, if we would just humble ourselves and say, God, I, I ask you for that. See, humble people know they need forgiveness, and they ask for it. His mercy pumps me up. But then he says, I'm not only a God of mercy. He goes on to say, I'm a gracious God. That's the next in this list. He's a gracious God, okay? And the word, when he says he's gracious, this means that God is given us unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor, and even ill-deserved favor. We've talked about this recently, the grace of God, that he favors us. Now, it's only a very weak God. Think about back thousands of years ago now. Only a very weak God or an incredibly benevolent God will serve the needs of mankind after they rebelled against him. And this is the God that we have. He's not a very weak God. He's a mighty, powerful God, the self-existent one, the almighty God. But he's a great, benevolent God in that even after I've stiff-armed him and smacked him and poked him in the eye a bunch of times, he still serves me. After I've committed high treason against him, he still serves me. And i got to tell you something. I don't know what you would do, but if I was God, I wouldn't stand for what others keep doing to me. I was talking to somebody yesterday how that every day mankind across the globe, 7.2 million people, billion people, poke God in the eye. We all do it. Even those who are the best of us do it. And God doesn't wipe us out. It's pretty amazing to me. His grace is unbelievable. His mercy is unbelievable. And, and this is why these scriptures just do some great things for me. Just tear my heart up and just makes me love God all that much more. Um, just the fact that you and I are still breathing after all our rebellion is amazing. But he doesn't stop at that. He doesn't stop at just giving us breath. He gives us good things. I just want you to think for a moment about all the divine favorable things that he gives to you day in and day out in your life. Listen, you live in the United States of America. That's pretty good. If you've been to a third world country, that's pretty good. And you live in this era, that's pretty good. And you probably live in a good place in Virginia Beach that's at least decent, that's pretty good. I mean, you say what... Others have this and others have more, but a whole lot of others have a whole lot less. And this is God's divine favor just by being in the United States, this country founded on the Judeo-Christian principles. And you're blessed. And just look, God didn't only not take your life. He blesses you daily. He gives you rain. You're not in a famine right now. You're not without right now. Just think about every good thing you have. Now, there's no way to think about every good thing right this moment, but I'm going to list a few things that you should think about. First of all, the intangibles of, of um, things that you really can't touch in fullness, and that is, you know, you can touch loved ones, but you can't touch their love, you, and you can, you can experience it. But just think of, of the favor and the blessings of God. God didn't have to provide love in our hearts and put that kind of stuff there. He didn't have to give us hearts for that, consciousness, that kind of thing, those feelings in our soul for another person, those that we love. Um, what about the other experiences of, of, of tangible things like money? Um, some of you just, you're just, I mean, how about not having any? How would you feel? You didn't have any money. But you do, and so you get to go to you know, lunch, or you get to buy those shoes, or you get to purchase those you know, glasses or that purse or... Whatever, you get to go to a ball game or get that hot dog or have that car. I mean, just the, the money that you've got is God's benevolence to you, his grace to you. Food, clothing, shelter, things like that. Deodorant. Have you thank God for deodorant lately? I mean, that's a good thing. I've sat next to some of you. And so I just, all right, just kidding. All right, pets. Some of you glad we got pets, got pets, you know? And so that's a good thing. Air conditioning. It's good. You're in a place right now. You're sitting on soft seats. You've got air conditioning. You've got a screen behind you. You know, you're comfortable. Maybe you're drinking water or coffee or something. And, and God gives these things to you. Friendships, toothbrushes. That's a good one too, right? Uh, hair. Some of you would look very funny bald. I just, want, I just want you to know that. You ladies, could you just imagine no hair on your head? I'll just leave it at that. Uh, God gives us entertainment, he gives us fun, he gives us exercise and sports. 
He gave you your brain, your personality, your wit, your humor, your temperaments. He's given all of these things, your skills. He gives forgiveness. He answers prayer. He gives us heaven and eternity. And then the real necessities. Coffee, chocolate, ice cream, pizza, wings, things like that. These are things that God gives to us in his grace. Now, if that doesn't sauce your wings, I don't know what will. But this is why this passage pumps me up. Think about it. Think about this. Here, here's, here's what I want you to think about this. God freely gives his favor to you and to me 24-7, 365. It never ends. He's just gracious. And if you are not a thankful person, you won't recognize this. But if you're a person who learns what gratitude is, you'll start thanking God for even the small things in your life, like your bladder. Just, I mean, God, thank you for a bladder that works. You know, what if it didn't? Never mind. We won't go there. So that's an aspect of God's, uh, his character, his nature, his essence, that you should be pumped up about. He's merciful. He's gracious. Now let's look at the next one. Here's another aspect of God that just rocks my world. It's this. He's slow to anger. This means that he's long-suffering or he's slow to wrath. Okay? He's long-suffering. That means he suffers long with Steve's junk before anything happens. He is long-suffering before I get disciplined in a firm way. Now, he'll discipline me by talking to my heart, just like he'll do you. But God is long-suffering. Have you ever thought you know, about this before? Why God doesn't just um, you know, take you out? I, God, it's amazing to me. Um, this phrase, a little rendition of the idiomatic uh, Hebrew is that God is long of nose. Isn't that interesting? That's what this phrase, he's long-suffering or he's slow to anger, means long of nose. It pictures one who gets, who, who, whose nose gets red and burns with anger. And the idea here is, but because God's, of God's compassion, his nose becomes so long that it would take forever to burn completely. So it's the idea in the Hebrew idiomatic term is that you know, God's long his nose is real long, and it's hot out here, but it never just burns to a place where it really gets to him because he's compassionate to you and to me. And listen to the Joel chapter 2, verse 13. It says this. Listen, this is for you. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and boundless in loyal love. He is always eager to forgive and not punish. Now, why does this passage pump me up, this scripture that we're looking at in Exodus chapter 34 about God's nature? Well, I w again, I was trying to write down and failing in the process why this aspect of God's nature, slow to anger, just wrecks me on the inside. And here's what I wrote down. And these don't cover it, but, but I was writing things. I was trying, you know, trying to just clarify, why do I get jazzed up about this so much? And here's what I wrote. Because I'd be dead if, it, if he wasn't long-suffering. Uh, the second bullet point I wrote down, because God is perfectly patient, and I'd be toast if he weren't. Um, and third one I wrote down was, because anger produces wrath, and wrath produces pain, and I don't want pain. I wrote that down. But then what I really got to is this one on the screen here is this. Because when I understand God's long-suffering, that he's slow to anger, it makes me love him more and more that he put up, puts up with me. That's probably the best thing I could do. It makes me love him more and more because he puts up with me. Can I ask you a question? How about you? Do you see God putting up with you? I know you do because I'm probably... Um, more two, goody two shoes than you, because people say my staff at least says that. You know, Steve, you need to sin a little bit more. Um, so, uh, and just like be the rest, like the rest of us out here, that kind of thing. So, um, I just, I, I sometimes I'm driving, and I, you know, when I'm not thinking of other things, or just certain times in the day, I think, you know, God, why do you really put up with me? Why don't you just take me out? Because I, I just know I'm not honoring you like I should. I know, I know my attitude stinks. I know that the way I'm, I'm displaying you to others isn't right. The way I just did that was wrong. The way I drive is 58 and a 35? You kidding me? Why don't you just... God, the way I treated my wife or my kids or kicked that cat? I didn't. I'm just kidding. You know, God, you know, when I sin, 
I, I hate myself sometimes like that. You know, it's just an ugly part of Steve. And I think to God, God, you can just end this. Just, just take me out of here. And I wonder, do you ever feel that way yourself? Don't answer. And don't elbow. Just, just keep your arms in. Do you ever feel that way? See, but here's what you need to know. What I, what I know, at least up here, and I'm trying to get it down here better, is that God is long-suffering toward my sin, toward my junk. And he is toward yours too. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's long-suffering. Now let's look at the next. He's rich in unfailing love. This is God's loyal, unbreakable love. Can we get that up on the screen? He's rich in unfailing love. Rich, abounding. Did you notice? He's in unfailing love. It doesn't fail. Never gives up. Never runs out on me. We just sang that song. And, you know, as we're singing that song, his love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. And it's it, on and on and on it goes. And it does. It overwhelms us when we think about it. I don't deserve this kind of love. Look at Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22. It says this, It is because of the Lord's unfailing love that we are not completely wiped out. His mercies never end. Aren't you glad they're new every morning? Great is your faithfulness. So I asked myself the question, and I ask you the question, why, does, why should this pump you up? Why does this pump me up? And here's what I wrote down. God will never stop, never stop loving me, even when others would and others should. He'll never stop loving me. You might think, Steve, you, know, you don't know what I've done. No, I don't know what you've done. But God does, and he already decided a long time ago, he's not going to let your sin and your wickedness and your evil or mine and my evilness and my wickedness stop him from loving me. He, he's just not going to stop. You can't get him to stop loving you. In fact, if you want to know the truth, here's the truth. You look it up yourself. John, Gospel of John, chapter 17, I think it's verse 3, 4, or 5. It says that Jesus is saying, Father, you love them, meaning you, as much as you love me. Okay, that can change a little bit of my world. God, you love, Jesus is saying, you love Steve and the Johns and the Jennifers and the Riches and the Julies and the Joys and the James and the Marks and the, loves them as much as you love me. That's pretty cool. And he'll never stop. It'll be unending. This is what God says. While you breathe, you can be assured that God loves you as much as he ever could. And you can't get him to love you anymore. And you can't stop him from loving you, no matter what you do or don't do. And this is the moral nature of God. And this is why this passage pumps me up so much. Because God is for you. He's for me. He's for us. He's not against you. He's not looking to push you around, take your joy away. He's looking to give you mercy and grace to be long-suffering to you and to be rich in love, unfailing love, unbreakable love, loyal love, covenant love. It never ceases kind of love. It's the kind of love that doesn't kick you to the curb, but it picks you up, dusts you off, changes your clothes, and gives you a new start, a fresh beginning. That's the kind of love that we're talking about. That's the kind of love that God has for every one of you in here and those of you watching. And you need to understand this about the God that we're talking about, the God of the Bible. You don't have to wonder if God is a distant God, a critical God, an authoritarian God, or a benevolent God. Let God define who he is. God is this. You don't have to wonder anymore. You don't have to leave this place today going, I wonder what God is like. You can know what God is like. He reveals himself, and he does it on purpose so you don't have any more questions about that he's more than mighty, and he's more than all-sufficient, and self-sufficient, and the, the sovereign God. His moral qualities, he's gracious and merciful and long-suffering, slow to anger, and full of unfailing, unbreakable, loyal love to you. And he wraps up, and he says this, I'm rich 
in this one too. It's called rich in faithfulness. I'm rich in faithfulness. And here's what he says. The idea of being rich in faithfulness means that he's reliable, that God's reliable, that he's dependable. You don't have to worry about if he's going to change at all, that he's constant. Now, God's faithfulness reveals to us, it not only explains his nature, but listen, listen to this. It not only explains that God is faithful, his nature, but it awakens us to trust him. What, God? You promised that for me? God, you... You did that for me. You said this in your word that that's what you would be to me and give to me and you know, love me with and provide for me. And God says, yes. But God, can I really trust you there? God says, I am rich in faithfulness. You can rely on me. You don't have to worry. I'm never going to break my word. You may have had a daddy who broke his word. You may have had a mama who broke Or a boss who broke their word. Maybe you break your word, but I won't break my word. You don't ever have to worry about me going back on my word. Because once I declare it to you and give you a promise, if you meet certain conditions or maybe there's no conditions to meet, I will do it every single time. Without fail, you never have to worry again. So that means when you lose your job, if you lose your job, I'll provide for you. You don't have to worry. The faithfulness of God, you see, my friends, causes me to be so jazzed up, jacked up on the inside because I never have to ever again have anxiety about life because God is faithful to his promises. As I close today, I want you to uh, look at Joshua 23 with me, and here's what it says. Joshua is Moses' successor, and here's what Joshua said about God. And he's talking to people, and here's what he says. Look, today I'm about to die. And you know with all your heart and being that not even one of all the faithful promises the Lord your God has made to you is left unfulfilled. Every one was realized. Not one promise is unfulfilled. Not one. He's telling millions of people this. Not one has God left undone. He said it, he did it every single time. In fact, if you don't think so, let me know. And nobody could say anything about it because they knew God was true to everything he said. And why this pumps me up so much and should pump you so much is this. It is because God is always dependable and his promise is always true. And so when God tells you that his tangible blessings, his financial provision is there for you, if you, if you do your part, he will certainly do his part every single time. Like Daniel mentioned today in the offering. Now the offering's already taken, so it's not like we're trying to get you to give something you're not willing to give. But just think about this. If you honor God, he said he would honor you, but he would honor you more than you honored him. So maybe it's about time for some of you to step up in your own heart, your own walk with God, and start giving to the kingdom of God. If you don't want to give here, don't. But give someplace where you can trust. But start giving. It's, it's proof that you're saying, God, I trust you with my resources. But God not only promises that he'd bless you back tangibly, he gives intangible blessings. And he says, I'll bless you there too. And I'm faithful and dependable that you can trust me for things like a stress-free, you know, in, in, uh, a worry-free life even though there's stress in life, even though there's pressures in life, you don't have to have anxiety. God says he'll give you strength during persecution. He'll support you during temptation. Uh, God says that he'll help you grow spiritually and learn about him more and more and grow within spiritual muscles. The Bible says that God will give you power during life's difficulties. And he also gives you the promise of heaven and so many more things. Now, as I close, and, and this is the truth, I'm closing right now, and here's what I want to say to everybody here. Today, you're standing here or sitting here, I should say, and um, you might think, Steve, I heard what you said, but the truth is, I don't think God can forgive me for that because there's got to be a category right over here, this category that you cannot be forgiven for. You're sitting here wondering, will God really forgive me, Steve? It sounds so good. It's all poetic. It's just... Wow, God really says that about himself, but really? Does he really want me? And I want you to know, there is only one sin that can't be forgiven. And that is the rejection of the one who forgives. Think about that for a moment. If you reject the one who's the forgiver, and you reject the only one who's the forgiver, then you can't have forgiveness. And that's the only sin that can't be forgiven. 
but every other sin from murder down to picking up an extra pen at work and taking it home with you can be forgiven. And God wants to forgive you. But here you can leave today knowing that I can be forgiven right here in my seat. All I need to do is humble myself before God and say, God, I have done wrong. And I've done wrong against you and I ask you to forgive me through the cross of Christ, what he did for for me on the cross. He sacrificed his life to pay for my sins. That's all you have to do. Believe on that. The rest of us, you need to understand, you've already been forgiven. You need to understand God is merciful all the time to you. All the time. Gracious all the time. Long-suffering, slow to anger. (laughs) Has a long nose. It's not burning here. It's maybe burning out there, but he's slow to bring discipline your way that's harsh or firm. That God is a God whose love is unending, unceasing, and he is faithful, rich and abounding in faithfulness to his promises toward you. And that's what you should walk out here, out of here with today. This is the God who I serve. So would you bow your heads with me right now? I told you I was done. I really did mean it that time, not the first time. (laughs) Father, I wanted to say thank you for who you are. There's none like you. What a God that we serve. There's so many other false interpretations of who you are and false assumptions and conjectures and guesswork through and through this land. But um, we don't have to guess. And we don't have to wonder any longer what you're like. So thank you for opening our eyes to what you are all about. And I just pray, Father, that the person who wants to receive you today, who wants forgiveness, would right now, in their chair, call on you by humbling themselves and saying, Jesus, I want you in my life. And if you're ready to do that, I want to pray this prayer with you and just simply, but with a heartfelt way, with all of your heart, call on God for his forgiveness. Just pray something like this. Would you, with me, would you just say, Jesus, you see, because he's the one who died on the cross to pay for your sins, he's the substitute, the sacrifice, the payment for your sins. Jesus, would you forgive me of all my wrongs, all my sins, and come into my life, make me yours? I put my faith in you today, August 24th, 2014. I thank you for that. Now, if you're a believer, I want you to, God, I want, to tr- I want you to say, God, I want to trust you in this area more. I want to trust you in your mercy toward me. Or maybe you need to trust God in his grace toward you more. Or possibly long-suffering, that he's slow to anger toward you. You thought he was quick to anger, but he's slow to anger. Or maybe you need to trust in God's unfailing love or his abounding faithfulness to keep his promises toward you. As a believer, where do you need to be? So receive that. Just put your faith in him right now in that area that you need to, and trust him afresh and anew right now in your seat, right there. Father, we reaffirm our trust, our faith in you in these areas, choosing to no longer doubt you, in this or these areas, but trusting you implicitly, without reservation, without hesitation, because we realize that not only are you the self-existent one, but you're a God who abounds in mercy and grace. You're slow to anger, rich in love and faithfulness. And we thank you for that today. In your name, Jesus. Amen.